All right. Welcome back to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. Uh, we're going to get into a topic today that um, for some people, it may seem like it's, uh, why are you covering that, Karen? That's so basic. But it really is important. And, and part of it is because of my own epiphany of late <clears throat> websites. Websites should function as a 24-7 sales and marketing tool. <clears throat> I'm taking this actually verbatim straight off of um, one of the uh, uh, web magnets or lead magnets that my guest today, William Chestier, is going to talk to us more about. But so, so I'm not claiming this. This is actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not as brilliant as this to know all this stuff because I have not been doing it. You know, it's one thing to walk the walk and talk the talk. And I do a lot of talking and I haven't done a lot of walking. So anyway, a big mistake business owners make is thinking that just having a website is good enough. In reality, there's a lot of strategy and moving parts that go into a successful website that works for your companies or in your service. First off, um, you've got to, you know, get into, uh, you know, what are you going to do with your website as an experience for, for each and every website visitor that you have? You want your target audience to visit your website and have it resonate with them immediately, right? You think about if you ever track any of your stuff, people pop off it all the time. Why is that? Because it wasn't what they were expecting when they clicked through to whatever they saw that made them want to click through to it. And so what do you do if it, what do you do and, and does it match that need? How much, how does it make your life better? This is the questions that the, the, the prospect is doing. It's like, does it match the need that they were expecting? Were they expecting this company or product or service to make their life better? And then how do you get your products and services uh, through your website? <clears throat> Some of you, I'm not going to go like duck here, but listen, even an experienced entrepreneur and advisor like myself that knows this stuff fundamentally, that the website is a tool, a 24-7 tool, right, can easily fall into the trap of build it and they will come. That's because just because I do a podcast and I talk about the value I bring to the marketplace to help entrepreneurs break through their obstacles for getting access to capital and all my experience of helping angel investors avoid deals that will lose them money. Potential customers of my target market are going to just, I, you know, I'm thinking this is how I, I'm having this uh, self-talk thing of what I've been going through lately, that all these potential customers of my target market are just going to figure out what it is I sell and how they gauge with me. And, and, and that even when I'm sharing on my social media platforms, kind of promoting an article that's important or a podcast or something like that, trust me, they don't. They don't. I I have had a wake up call of late of clearly how out of step I was on uh, on because some of my messaging and my conversion and because, you know, you sometimes you build your website and then you kind of forget about it and you go about doing your business through LinkedIn or getting leads through referrals or for this kind of stuff. But you really should be be measuring it. You should be tracking it. You should be looking at conversion numbers, all those kind of things to understand whether it's really working for you. And for the entrepreneurs, that they're like, oh, yeah, I don't get many leads from my website. Well, there's a reason for that. And investors, if you're investing in a company that their sales are tapering off or the news of the buzz that they're getting or whatever is not maintaining, this is important for you too. So sit tight. If your online present isn't getting the volume of leads, customers or investors, right? As investors be really become a customer of a company in the concept of what is the value they bring before they ever decide to buy equity in that company. <clears throat> you can have, you know, great products that solve a problem, but they're just not generating the leads or converting that con the conversation you're about to have is for you. And if not you, then who? And share this with them. Because my guest today, William Chester, is the founder of Chess Tech. He has all this knowledge and then some. He even hosts a podcast, too, Talking Solutions. But as with a lot of experienced entrepreneurs that uh, could, could service any business, but because of his own passion for sustainable companies and companies that have an impact, 
he has nuanced his focus for those kind of companies. So this is a double benefit. It's going to have the baseline of, of what you have to do to, to make your website be a tool. But also we're going to talk very specifically about this when it comes to the sometimes the complex messages that sustainable companies and impact companies have. And even his mission statement on his website and call to action, which is very clear on his homepage, well done. Uh, and that is chesstech.com, C-H-E-S. H T E C H dot com, enhancing the impact of global and local change makers. We help purpose driven companies create a greater impact by turning your website and content into a 24 7 sales and marketing machine. Really clear, right? Very clear. And if you're in the business for that, if that's a need you have, if you answered any of those little questions of what is this, his website's done it. So he's walking the walk and talking the talk. And welcome to the show, William. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Karen. I'm uh, happy to be here and happy to dive into this conversation. Great. So it looks like you started your career after graduating from Washington State University as a, uh, in press and as a reporter, and that led into helping digital media. And then with a shift to pure web digital media um, until starting Chess Tech in 2020. What inspired that shift and what was it like starting a company in 2020? Was that because of the pandemic or in spite of the pandemic, because there was an increase in demand for the type of services that you were offering? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Really is a great question on that front. Uh, you know, for me, that my journey is certainly a little bit more unorthodox than most, I would say, on that front. But, you know, I'd venture to guess some people would say that theirs are as well, uh, but certainly unique in its own right. So as you mentioned before, I graduated from Washington State. After I graduated from Washington State, I was a sports broadcaster, actually, as a sports director in the, the St. Louis media market uh, and calling play by play and doing games and writing content for sports articles and journalism and digital media and things of that nature as well. So a little bit different than, than what I do now. And really, the big change came uh, in about 2018 when I was uh, about two years into it. And I kind of realized, oh, no, this is not what I want to do long term. And so I needed to pivot and I needed to change. Um, and so by doing so, I, I went down to uh, Colombia, the country, and uh, I finished learning Spanish. I have Latino heritage, and so I wanted to kind of refine my my Spanish abilities. And I went down down there, and I, while I was down there, uh, I learned how to code thanks to a couple individuals that uh, that I had met down there. One one was learning to code as well. The other uh, was a vet, a veteran in that space. So I learned technology, and within that, I kind of started, and I got pretty good at it. Spent the whole year doing it and, and learning, and I was trying to get a job in in engineering when the pandemic hit. And as okay. for a lot of people, um, that got hard because, you know, companies kind of put on a little bit of a hiring freeze because they weren't really quite sure what was going to happen in the in the first days. And, uh, you know, it was an adapt adaptation I had to make where fortunately, you know, I have a lot of confidence in myself at that time. And I thought, you know what, it, I'll continue to send off these apps. But in the meantime, I'm going to start making something happen on my own. Uh, and so I started kind of freelancing. I started the Chesh Tech thing and started working on websites, and, uh, mobile web applications, uh, and then it continued to grow from there. And, and as we started to kind of get the developing side done, I te teamed up with designers, brand messengers, and the Chesh Tech brand kind of evolved a little bit from that point to where we are today, where you know we work with primarily impact-driven companies and really help them with a sustainable web presence as well, uh, making your website more eco-friendly, and then of course can get leads and become that that magnet that you're talking about. Okay, so <clears throat> you said something there that um, I want to digress on, but maybe it'll be part of kind of this next question. So, I mean, because this term sustainable impact. It's broad, right? It could be a product that they're offering. It could be, um, you know, how the simple, you know, how they operate with their own company, right? You mentioned sustainable websites and the way they run. So that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I hope you'll share that. But it's like, so if it's not clear cut as a simple feature function benefit, right? Most websites would be like, you're here for this widget that does this thing. If that story is a longer story, right? Because sometimes the convert the value proposition might be a little bit tougher that if it's a product that's sustainable, it might have a higher cost basis to it. So a higher price, but there's this, this uh, sort of subjective benefit, you know, it may solve the problem, you know, a, a hammer hitting the nail is, you know, these want a hammer to hit the nail and 
you know, one of them might be like a super great, you know, sustainable nail and one's not, you know, whatever that might be. Right. So, you know, what it is it, it how, so first of all, how do you define it within your scope? And then um, what is it that like the nuances of what a, co a company, if they are in that space, need to think about because it it is it may not be something that's just a, a a sentence with a click here to learn more kind of a thing yeah really great question i mean is especially when you talk about the impact space as you mentioned that's very 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 broad range of what is impact right i mean a lot of times i think people think of it more in sustainability climate tech climate change things of that nature and those solutions but there are many other solutions as well you know i've interviewed a, a gentleman on my own show who has identity learning, which is all about transracial adoptions and community resources for parents and foster parents and adoptive parents and for the kids and the traumas that come with that. And, you know, to me, that's impact as well. That's an impact sure. message. Um, so when you when you bring that to the website and you're trying to actually put together a target goal, the most important thing that you can do if, for your website is to make sure that whoever you're developing your website with, uh, designing it with and messaging with, is that they understand your business goals, not just your marketing goals. But what is the number one goal of your business and what are you trying to do with that in the future to kind of grow with that? You mentioned, you know, sometimes the value proposition can be right there on the headline and it's straightforward and it's easy like we do this and that. Sometimes it requires more messaging on that front. So you need to think of your website almost as a story, if you will. And so if the story is if the website is your story, then the people going to the website is you want to position themselves as kind of the main character of the story. And so if you have a more complex messaging thing, then what you need to do is think about the goals, which is your primary CTA, what is your secondary CTA, and what's the funnel that leads on your website to them achieving that. If you have a lot of information, you want that homepage to entice them and get them to say, oh, okay, I it's clear. The number one thing that you can do on your website is that value prop in the headline at the very first thing they see on your primary landing page is that it's clear and you know what they want to do. You don't want the website visitor to use, you know, brain calories, if you will. Nobody wants to think when they're trying to find a solution. They just want to be told exactly it is what you do, things of that nature. So if that's clear right off the top, you're going to be in a good spot. And a great way of breaking that down is just thinking about how you would want your target user for like, target user or target website visitor to think through the flow of your website. And so that's the number one thing that you need to think about is what are the customer touch points, if you will, to get to that main website goal that you're trying to accomplish that then supplements your main business goal on that front, because they might be a little bit different. Uh, so that is the root approach I would take when thinking about setting up your website goals and how that flow of your website will work. Because if you can think about those touch points and bring them down into a story, and then that story ends with them hitting your call to action, then that's going to be a completion kind of that story and allow that user website visitor to completely understand how your website functions and works. Okay, so how does a website become more sustainable in the way it functions? Uh, do you mean like uh, what I mentioned earlier about eco-friendliness? Yes. So this is a, a, a trend that I think is starting to pick up a lot more steam as we get a lot more information about that. But what a lot of people don't know is that the digital carbon footprint in the internet is a, about equivalent to the aviation industry. Which really? when you hear, yeah, it's is about that, three. The, the electricity they require to run the servers, servers. And things like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there's a lot of power that needs to get. <laughs> there you go. Very good. There's a lot of power that needs to be run for a lot of these servers. And a lot of generally old websites are run through databases and servers. And when they get really hot, you need to have a really good cooling system in those uh, warehouses where you're storing all those services. And so you're utilizing a lot of energy. And so what a more sustainable website is, is really in line with user experience, which is why it's kind of great because you're enhancing the user experience in addition to enhancing, you know, the eco impact of your website and making it more sustainable. So what do I mean by that? Uh, for the most part, site speed is the most important. So what you'll see with a lot of sites that are hosted, for example, on like WordPress or things of that nature is that they require a database, a server, and then what's called the client side, that front end, which is all the stuff that you can see. So what happens on a website is, is every time you click into that URL, there's an HTTP, which is just like a network request, and it brings all of those resources in 
and loads them right there into the browser so that you can have access to them. Now, if you have a lot of videos or images or heavy resources, images, carousels, a big hero image, um, a video on your website, that's a heavy resource that takes time to load, which requires a lot of energy. So a solution to that is you could create something more eco-friendly. You can utilize, still on WordPress, you can use things like caching. You could minify your images and make the file sizes smaller, which is a pretty easy thing for people to do. And if you want to get really, really kind of, you know, and you have the budget for a developer and things of that nature, you could utilize what's called static site generation. And basically what a static site is, is stuff that doesn't change. It's not dynamic, right? So this works really well for your marketing website for your company. If you're a SaaS company or something and you just have a marketing site and you're just trying to sell your product and all the information is going to remain the same, there's no updates or liking or comments and stuff that needs to change in real time, then it's a great way to do what's called the static site generation. And all that is, is it basically, instead of fetching resources on, on entry of the request, you pre-build your content. And then it gets broken down into HTML and CSS, which is much better than JavaScript when it comes to uh, performance. And then it's served directly from your browser. So you eliminate that server and database type of structure, which means that you're not fetching resources every time, which results in number one, excellent site speed, which then results in excellent user experience. I don't know about you, Karen, but I certainly don't like it when I go to a site and it loads really slow and I have to wait for many seconds and... I don't like it when mine loads slow and I go from page to page. I was like, exactly. what up with that? Exactly. So clearly so, uh, I don't have a very sustainable website. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but yeah. and that's the beautiful part about that static site is that it's instant because there's no loading because everything's already preloaded. So you click on it, it's already served in your browser and it's super fast, which leads to a great user experience. And then you have the be uh, added benefit of having it be more eco-friendly and more yeah. sustainable. But now if you have like pop-ups or you have a sort of like a call to action video that's going to need to play, then mm -hmm. it's not static, right? No, if you have a video that needs to play, that that's still static. So basically if like your video is, is just being pulled off or you have it inside the code, it's still something that you can have on there. It's not static if, for example, you have like real time changes. So think of like an application style. So like a uh, Facebook, you know, you go in and you write a comment. And then that comment appears on the web page. That's dynamic uh, because, okay. yeah, there's like a post, what's called like a post request. And then you have to get that information back and it updates in real time. So static is what a lot of business owners would have for their websites where they're just posting what we call like a marketing site. Just lots of information about their product and they're trying to sell what their uh, call to action is. So can you do that and say like your homepage has, in the, like in my case, I have the, uh, a feed from my podcast that, you know, the la latest five shows. So that's dynamic. But then other pages that are underneath that could be static. So you could have a mix of it within your site to have a better foot performance in general and uh, also footprint. Wonderful question. And with the newer technologies that are out there with that static site generation that I talked about, you absolutely can. It gets a little bit more like WordPress is just all in one. So you can't mix that up like that. Um, but if you use a technology, again, this would require the the knowledge of a developer or, or an engineer on that front, but you can use a, what are called those static site generators. And within some of those static site generators, you can do exactly what you said. One page can get the dynamic and request and fetch the information that's needed to show up on your site and update it in real time. And then your other three pages could just be statically built and you could just go boom, boom, boom. And it's all pre-built. And again, you're minimizing your, uh, eco, uh, or I'm sorry, your, your carbon footprint on that front from your website. And then also at the same time, you're enhancing that user experience because everything's boom, 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 super quick. Yeah. Okay, great. So when it comes to digital media, right? Because that's part of sort of an integration of brand, of identity. You know, there's all this messaging that people hear out on the, you know, oh, you've got to be on these social media platforms and you got to do this kind of stuff. And then you also have, you know, companies that when they're raising capital, they'll be like, oh yeah, we're going to go get our, our business because we're going to do this amount of Facebook ads or whatever, right? And, and you know, how is there pros and cons here, if you will, um, 
for a, awareness of your company within social media or engagement and conversion of your followers because they're already kind of know who you are, but maybe they don't go to your have gone to your website and you're trying because you you can't get them into your funnel and you can't really you know set up whatever your you know I would think it it by you know default your whatever your email marketing system and stuff has to be consistent with the messaging on your website you know the business that you're in uh do you does that become um uh something then that uh is important for it to be consistent with the messaging on the website versus because you know you you know, websites are sometimes a bigger conversation than what you could have within something that's a social media post that establishes your credibility or or offers something, a piece of information to engage with. So how do you approach that and advise your customers or best practices on, you know, how to truly use digital media as a, uh, can do a conduit to get more traffic to your website that then can convert. It's almost like a, a double conversion. You got to have them click through and, you know, convert once they get there. Another fantastic question within that. There's a lot of nuances that need to be involved and you really need to think about the most important is understanding your, your buyer personas, you know, or your user personas, depending on, on what you're selling. It's most important. Number one, to figure out where they're hanging out, why they're hanging out there and what they want by hanging out there. And if you can address that, you can figure out through each maybe social media channel what your goals are gonna be on that front. For example, uh, on Instagram, you might be able to have um, sustainable consumers because a lot of people are trying to be sustainable brand consultants on Instagram. You can get your information out from short form reels and videos and your goal on your Instagram will have to, okay, I want to, collect this many followers. And some of your social media posts are like you said, it may not be completely connected to your website because you only want to do that one singular message and have people understand that that's what you're doing. And that's okay. But if you're trying to sell something or you're trying to get people to go to your website, that's where I think there needs to be consistency throughout. Otherwise, the person that goes to your website is going to see you giving this messaging about one thing on one platform, and then it goes to your website and they can't find anything about that platform or about that message that you're giving. And then that's going to cause a little confusion. And if they get confused on their website, uh, on your website at all, they might get annoyed and click out and then they leave and you've lost that website visitor. You've lost a conversion. Now, there's a couple ways that you can actually supplement that where you might have different products that you're selling that may or may not be directly related. They might be slightly different. And if they are slightly different or not directly related, then there are ways you can create like a landing page. So instead of using your whole website. Oh, sure. Yeah. Instead of using your whole website, if you have an individual campaign, you could generate a landing page and then send that people to that um, landing page. So let me give you like a quick example. So for example, um, you know, with my my individual podcast, I have like a freebie, if you will, uh, where you find out eight startups that are giving consumers tips and tools to be more sustainable consumers. This for me is the main CTA that I have on my Instagram because the people going to Instagram may not necessarily listen to my podcast. They may not be podcast listeners at all, right? But like you said, it's another channel to release your message, your overall business goal and message. And my overall business goal is to create more awareness in the sustainable entrepreneurship space in impact-driven companies as a whole for founders and investors. And I can do that without having people go and listen to my podcast. I can create that awareness on Instagram. So I create that freebie and then I generate, boom, there's a landing page for that freebie that funnels people in and then it gets them to the newsletter. And then in the newsletter, you're still educating them. And maybe you can finally converting them to be a podcast listener, but not everyone's a podcast listener, right? Versus that might be different than a paid ad that I run on Facebook where I target, you know, people who like podcast posts, you know, Facebook's got all your data. So, it's, you know, you're able to really kind of niche down on there. And then my post there might be more about, you know, an educated guest that I had and promoting that episode and then getting them to go to my website because that's going to land on my website yeah. and it's going to go in. And that's where I go back to my initial uh, comment about how the website needs to be and understand your business goals because the website can supplement your business goals 
but then there are still your, you know, subset of goals that can reach your overall message, but in a different format. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So yeah, because landing page, because, you know, once you get them, the whole, you know, the old adage that a lot of internet marketers have used is, you know, the gold is in the list, right? So it's in, you know, so just be followers is one thing. And if you're just doing, you know, advertising or you're, you know, an influencer and so you get paid because X number of people might see your thing and, you know, maybe click through to that product you're promoting. But with you as a business owner, you know, your um, you, the uh, followers are nothing unless mm -hmm. they convert to become mm -hmm. something where you can have a conversation with them. And, you know, they, you know, it's not if you're not just doing something that's on like an Etsy where it's click and buy and it's an emotional, yes, I want to buy that now. And it's a quick transaction. It's done. But if you're trying to sell a higher end service or sell a, or have a, a different kind of conversation that has, that oftentimes has to happen over time so that they will, you know, push the button to set up a meeting, right. Or, you know, then buy something. Right. So I think that's, that's good to be able to sort of explain that, that difference and how you would use them because um you know and, and figuring out where your audience is for what mm -hmm. it is you're doing a lot of times people will throw mud on the walls and just be you know everything i'll be on every platform and it's the same thing on every platform but it's not necessarily the right audience like i haven't done tiktok because i like i feel like i have to sing in order to do tiktok but i've been told that you know no there's actually people doing you know business and different kinds of, you know, talking about money on TikTok and stuff like that. Right. But, you know, I didn't really ever feel like it was my target audience. So I just haven't done it where, you know, LinkedIn is more of my target audience. Right. So, um, exactly. so as we start to wrap up here, uh, I'd like to say, you know, when you do, you mentioned a little bit earlier about two different audiences, right. You might have two different services. I have that I have entrepreneur and I've struggled with this messaging like for a long time. <laughs> His, you know, you have the investor. Here's what we do for investors. And here's what we do for entrepreneurs. And they're, you know, they're two different messages, two different sets of services. Ultimate goal is creating wealth, you know, by being a successful entrepreneur and an investor investing in a successful entrepreneur. But how you get there is different, right? And so when it comes to entrepreneurs that might be a sustainable company, an impact company, and they're also raising capital, again, a little bit of a different message right? I think it's not quite the same because they're not, they, I mean, they are kind of selling it, but I get, maybe it, it goes to the landing page um, aspect of it first, or a lot of companies just have their investor tab at the top, you know, so it's the same value proposition when you land on the homepage. And then you're hoping that those people that are there go like, oh, I really love this. Oh, you mean I can invest in that? I had no idea I could invest in it. And they'll click the button to you know, the tab to sort of do that. So do you, er, do you ever get into that kind of trying to figure out for a company how to finesse the different goals as well as your different audiences? Yeah. The different goals. That's, that's something that you can, I always advise simplicity is key. I think people try to overcomplicate their messaging. And a lot of times on your website, it's exactly what you said. You just put the word investors as a tab and you know, that, what is exactly does that mean? Okay. I'm an investor. So I'll click on it. And then I have to click through things and it's may not be as clear as it could be. Right. Or for example, you know, LinkedIn is where you get a lot of your uh, investors are going to be, if you weren't trying to pitch for fundraising, but then, you know, for the Instagram is where most of your, you know, consumers or, client or customers are going to be right. And right. so your approach is going to be a little bit different in terms of uh, executing that on a website. I think the most important thing you can do is just being transparent right up the front. So you could have a value prop uh, on your headline and then it can say, you know, we do these things here for both investors and entrepreneurs and then have a button that says, are you an investor? Are you an entrepreneur? Or are you a customer? Or do you want to use the prop? Boom. And then they click on that and it takes you to a page where's yeah. that landing page. You use that down and then the customer uses that down and it may seem like, oh, that might look weird on the site, but if I'm a user and I come to it and I'm being told and it's laid out for me exactly what I need to do to find what I want to find, I'm going to be more likely to click through versus if I just go and I'm having to decipher something for myself, I'm going to get irritated and leave. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
That's good. The uh, we didn't really get into the apps and stuff, and maybe it's within your like the mobile mobile aspect of this. But it seems like, and I, I you tell me, is are the statistics still holding true that there's more people going to websites via a mobile device than through a traditional browser? That is still true. Uh, over fifty percent of internet users today will go to your website on a mobile search versus a desktop search. But again, got to understand who your target uh, persona is because they, if it, you're a you know a, a company that sells to other businesses, there's a good chance they're only going to look at you at, on desktop, right? Because they're going to look at you during a workday versus if you're you know B two C, and then a consumer is going to look at you when they're browsing on their phone watching TV. Okay. And I think, you know, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, mobile friendly and whatever, you know, you need big. But I've learned in in organizations that I've helped them with their website strategy, um, as well as my own, that it's real easy to take that for granted. And all of a sudden, you've got way too much stuff on the mobile version of this. And it may be important in your viewpoint to have these key messages, but it's just overwhelming and clunky when it comes down. So is that best done because you eliminate things or do you kind of create a whole nother sort of, you know, version of the mobile that goes into the mobile or, you know, like na navigating that because you've designed this website that has these call to actions and these pop-ups and things like that, that you're not going to want on your mobile, right? Exactly. And so when you have to really think about that, to me, it's two separate things. You're thinking about a user that's using a phone, which is different because you're scrolling with a thumb and you're utilizing a button versus a desktop where you're either using a touchpad or a mouse. And that's a lot easier to use. For example, a carousel on mobile is probably going to be a little bit easier to use when you're searching for products than a carousel on desktop, right? Because you're you can just swipe on your phone. It's easy versus on a desktop. You kind of have to click a button and it touches over and it's just kind of a little bit annoying or it's automatic and then you can't see it and it changes and that's annoying. Um, so it's really approaching the two uh, devices with their own unique approach based on what's going to be the best conversion rate for your users and the most convenient. Very good. All right. So what have we not talked about that you wanted to make sure that my listeners heard about you before? Again, it's chesstech.com, but uh, anything you want to add as we say our goodbyes? Yeah, I mean, I would just encourage people to go check out some more sustainable web practices. And if you're an impact-driven entrepreneur or somebody that's really passionate about sustainability and things of that nature, they directly correlate hand-in-hand -hand with uh, user experience for the most part. I would definitely check out um, the custom development space because you can do a lot of really cool things and hook up to a CMS and, and still allow your marketers, but also have a much better performing front end of your website that's more sustainable on that front. And if you have any questions on, on that, feel free to find me on LinkedIn, Will Cheshire and, and add me there or, or find us on our website at cheshtech.com and check out the podcast if you're interested in more stories about impact-driven founders talking yeah, solutions. Yeah, very good. Yes. And you have uh, some free resources on your website and you have a little pop-up thing that comes where people can set up an appointment right away with you, I think, right? So. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Thank you so very much, William, for being a guest on the Compassionate Capitalist Show and everybody onwards and upwards till next week.